Hello, good afternoon. It's uh, 1.30 in Eastern time. Um, I'm kind of nervous. This is my first webinar, so I hope all uh, goes quite well. Um, so just a little bit about myself. I'm an associate professor of biomedical engineering at the University of Virginia. Um, and I'm interested in target identification for uh, delivery, molecularly targeted delivery of therapeutic agents, um, and also uh, doing early detection for various cancers. Uh, the techniques that I use are pretty widely applicable across a number of diseases, cardiovascular, neural, cancer, all kinds of cancer. But since I mostly focused, or the main biology I focus on is pancreatic cancer, I thought I'd go ahead and just uh, give you an application or an example of using the techniques. So just a little bit, uh, if you would, hold your questions to the end um, and use the uh, writing tool uh, to submit the questions and then I'll read them online and then answer them if I can. Uh, and then also this is continuing education eligible, so if you need CE credit, um, then go ahead and click on whatever button you're supposed to click on. I think it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, so with that, I'll go ahead and get started and then take your questions at the end. So a little bit about the application. So when we go ahead and we start to design agents or think about um, designing agents, I'm an engineer, so that's what I do is design things. Uh, we first start to think about the application, and the first thing we do is we talk to the end user, and in this case, it's the clinician, and so you have to have an understanding of what the clinicians are going to want um, and, and what they're going to need and use in order to make it applicable. Um, so in the case of pancreatic cancer, uh, it's it, it hardly cracks the top 10 in terms of estimated new cases. So you can see I'm going to draw on the whiteboard, which I think this is fantastic. Pancreas cancer is right here. It's, it's low um, in uh, incidence in male and female. But on the other hand, if you look at estimated deaths from cancer, it shoots up to the number four leading cause of death due to cancer in the U.S. And it's estimated that it's actually going to overtake uh, the other cancers in terms of death because of the obesity epidemic and, and uh, other things. So it's a significant problem in the United States and, and abroad. Um, and again, this is just replotting this. So if you look at a percentage of death over incidence, pancreatic cancer has a five-year survival rate of roughly only about 6%. And so that's not, that's not really good. So 96 or 94% of patients will succumb to their illness within five years. On average, so 80% of um, patients that are, um, appear due to symptoms and they are usually, um, they are not eligible for surgery. So currently surgery is the only, is the only uh, route for, for cure. Um, and so, like I said, 80% of patients are not eligible for surgery. They're already metastatic when they, when they present and they come into the clinic. Um, the other 20% are eligible for surgery. They have a better median survival time of about 15 months. If a patient is not eligible for surgery, that mean survival time is about three to six months. However, it is getting better. Um, there are new regimens, Fulfirinox, for example, that is, that is making it uh, better. Also, Abraxane. So there is some strides, but, but still, the five-year survival rate is really dismal. So there are some challenges to pancreatic cancer. One is the, it, like most cancers, the asymptomatic nature of the disease. Um, it's also difficult to image. So where clinicians uh, in the community has made incredible strides in cancer detection um, or cancer treatment and cure has been in early detection. So the smaller you can find it, if you can find it in stage one, of course, it's, it's much easier to treat and to cure. So breast cancer, you have mammogram for breast cancer, colon cancer, um, those rates are in the 90 uh, or greater percent. And in fact, the American Cancer Society released a statement saying that if um, more people would go ahead and get the screening, that 60% of the deaths due to colon cancer would be prevented just by increasing compliance with the screening protocols. 
um, melanoma, it's easy, you can visualize it. So what all these things have in common is they have detection techniques that are relatively cheap, they're relatively easy, relatively non-invasive. I know the bowel prep is bad for uh, colon cancer, but anyway, um, early detection and imaging. Pancreatic is not just so easy. So as you can see from, from this diagram, here's your pancreas right here, but right around the pancreas you have the liver, uh, you have the, the stomach and the spleen, and these are all sorts of bowels and things. And so, oh, and the kidneys are in the back. So the pancreas lies right in the middle. There's no open lumen to it. And so endoscopic ultrasound is typically what's used. And that's dropping an uh, endoscope down uh, through the esophagus into the stomach and then trying to, trying to image it. But it's not, it's not so easy to detect. And so what we're starting to do is working on a way to be able to do early detection of pancreatic cancer. Now I have to say that imaging techs, tests are not going to be the first line, especially since the incident rate is so low for pancreatic cancer. Um, any, even if you've got a 99.9% .9 sensitivity and specificity, the sheer number of people that you would be screening, you would have way more false positives or false negatives, especially false positives, which would have a bigger workup, um, then you would actually cure from, from the cancer. And so what we're looking at is using things. So right now we know certain things about um, family, uh, certain families, uh, and also high risk factors, new onset diabetes, so people that had normal, that have a normal BMI but just have new onset diabetes. Um, chronic pancreatitis is a, a large risk factor for pancreatic cancer. And then as serum testing comes online, as serum biomarkers are found, um, then you would plug imaging into that, that clinical uh, paradigm. You're always going to need to image to determine extent of disease um, and to to look at the disease, the spread, all of that. And so imaging plays an important role in current clinical uh, diagnosis and current clinical management. So with that, pancreatic cancer is deceptively, deceptively homogeneous. The first mutation is a KRAS mutation. 95% of, of people will get a KRAS mutation. However, KRAS is a terrible biomarker because it's up in a lot of benign conditions. So the pancreatic intraepithelial neoplasm one, so pan in one, uh, those are not going to become cancer uh, in a person's lifetime or the, the likelihood of it when you detect it would be low. Same thing with pan in two. And at that time, so you get the classic oncogene activation in KRAS, you get the loss of the tumor suppressors in P16 inc4a. Um, and then by panin 3s p 19 r P53 loss, and all of these are 90% or greater in patients. And so it's, like I said, it's pretty homogeneous, but that doesn't mean the disease is homogeneous. There's a lot of heterogeneity uh, in there. Um, Panin 3s are where you would want to detect, and also the cystic lesion, so on the right side with the IPMN and the MCNs, uh, there's about 100,000 cases of IPMNs, uh, and they are monitored yearly to determine whether or not they're big enough or if they look dysplastic. Um, so they're monitored for that. So being able to, to tell um, if the cyst has high-grade dysplasia versus low-grade dysplasia or cancer in there would, again, um, help a lot in clinical management. But understanding the disease progression really makes it so that mouse modeling can be done, especially since early tissues are so hard to come by. So if you want to be able to detect it really early, you want a marker that's up in pan in three, not present in chronic pancreatitis, not present in normal, not present in pan in one or two, which you wouldn't want to uh, disturb because touching or messing with the pancreas is, is pretty hazardous. You can provoke chronic pancreatitis or acute pancreatitis. There's a lot of things um, that could go wrong. So working with mouse modelers, uh, Nabil Bardizi and Ron DePinho, when uh, Ron was at uh, Dana-Farber, he's now president of MD Anderson, they made a mouse model of pancreatic cancer that has KRAS knock-in um, with an ink for a ARC deletion. 
And these animals, they, they, it's 100% penetrant, you get consistent kinetics, they have the mutations, and you can isolate cells from different stages of the disease. So the pan in one, normal, um, pan in three, and also tumor and metastatic tumor. So it gives us a source of tissue and cells that allow us to, to uh, try to find biomarkers. Um, and the other thing is, is that I know this is a mouse model. And so when I show you the screening tools, we'll show you, I'll show you that we're always mindful about the fact, I mean, there's no perfect way or perfect system to do something. And so we always cross reference or validate on human tissue and also mouse tissue, because we're going to do a lot of work in the mouse models in order to bring it to the clinic. So now becomes the question of, okay, well, what target should we go after? So if we're going to do molecular imaging and we want to look at a molecule that will help us distinguish benign from, from disease or benign from cancer, what molecule do you choose? And so this diagram is from Roche, um, and I don't have any disclosures with Roche. It's just a diagram that I got. Uh, it, this just shows the metabolome. It doesn't even show all of the proteins and the networks in the cells. And so how do you go ahead and decide what target you should go after? It becomes a really difficult uh, problem and it's very, very complex. And so I, as an engineer, I was thinking, well, what if we tell the target what it should be? What if we have design parameters or parameters for the target and we say, okay, we need it to be highly abundant and we need it to be accessible so we can deliver agents imaging or therapies to it. So it should be on the cell surface, it should be highly abundant and it shouldn't be present in normal or benign conditions. Well, that's all well and good, Kim, but how do you go ahead and do that? And what we are doing is we're using viruses in order to be able to um, identify these targets. So a side part of my lab is engineering, um, using biology to engineer new materials. And so the viral kingdom is really easy to understand. They have very few proteins. Um, the proteins are not redundant, so we can go ahead and, and play with them. So one of these ways is to be able to engineer um, M13, which is a filamentous bacteriophage, for multiple display. So phage display has been around since 1985 when it was published by George Smith from the University of Missouri in, in Columbia. A um, really brilliant idea. And, and you can link genotype with phenotype, and this will become important for the uh, target identif identification a little bit later. But anyway, we can get it to display different things. So we can get it to uh, target. So on this coprotein, this carries a peptide that will target um, cells. And then these coproteins, we can get them to complex different uh, nanoparticles. And in this case, it's iron oxide. So these iron oxides are super paramagnetic, so we could see them by MR, but they're also iron oxide, so you can heat them for therapy. But these are what the particles look like on EM. And then after we incubate these particles with the phage that are displaying a tumor targeting peptide, but also a peptide that will um, bind to these nanoparticles, you get decoration along the M13 virus that makes a nanowire. And these nanowires are, um, you can use them for MR, so they change relaxivity exactly how you would expect. And also they allow us to image the tumor. So what we are looking at here is this is the tumor pre-injection, uh, this is its MR signal, and then post-injection, we get a darkening and um, because it's iron oxide and it's super paramagnetic, it darkens on T2 star weighted MR images. And what you'll notice about this tumor is the heterogeneity. So we're actually picking up the heterogeneity of this prostate tumor. So uh, pretty exciting. Uh, but anyway, we can make them smaller, so long versus short versions. You can really genetically engineer and control these types of nanoparticles. So we're working on those in the lab. But really what we're doing, so to go back to this idea of identifying a target with certain parameters, we are going to use phage display. And so phage display, again, George Smith in 1985, he's got some really nice papers that describe this process and the considerations of it. 
But what you do is to make a library, and this is from New England Biolabs. Again, no disclosures, I'm not paid by them. Um, I do not get research funding from them. But you can engineer uh, restriction sites, so CAFIN-1 and EAG-1 in this, uh, and then you can have a length of amino acids, um, seven to 15, I think is the max you can do in this system, that have random, um, random base pairs. And that makes a library of 10 to the nine different peptides that are being displayed on the P3 coat protein of this particular phage or virus. And so that's what this looks like. So here is the P3 coat protein, this purple thing. The peptides are being displayed. There's four to five copies. So each one of these has a peptide being displayed. In this case, I'm using the linear library. You can use disulfide constraints um, and really play with Gibbs free energy for binding. So entropy and, and all of that with constraining conformations. But really why this is powerful is because genotype equals phenotype. So instead of having to do uh, 10 to the nine different wells or 10 to the nine times six different wells um, to do individual compounds for the right binding parameters. Instead, what you can do is throw them all in the same well, let them bind, wash away everything doesn't bind, and then just elute the ones that have the specific parameters. So by playing with elution conditions, you can really start to change um, how tight the peptide will bind. And then if you have whole cells, then only things that the phage are accessible to will be able to bind. You can even do this in vivo, and we've done a lot of screening, um, and Renata Pasquini and Eric Rusolati have pioneered this, where you can do in vivo, and they showed that you could uh, distinguish the blood vessels from different organs based on the peptides that bind, and they called them vascular zip codes. So anyway, for this screen, what we did is we took those cells that we could isolate from the mouse models, incubated the phage with the cell lines, allowed them to bind and internalize, because again, I want to internalize and deliver a drug potentially to these cells. Um, let them bind, wash away everything that didn't bind, uh, elute off the cell surface, and then lyse the cells and recover only the things that were able to internalize inside the cell. And then we subtracted against normal cells from the pancreas, so beta cells, um, acinar cells, and uh, pancreatic ductal uh, epithelium. And in that way, we remove everything that's ubiquitously bound. From there, we get a list of peptides. Uh, so in this case, we pick 30 plaques, um, get a list of peptides, and then we go ahead and do ELISA binding on uh, target cells, in this case, uh, the cancer cells versus the control ductal epithelium, and look at affinity versus specificity. So green means go. The brighter the green, the better the binding in that, or the better the, the number for that category. So for example, clone 27 and clone 15, we went ahead and did uh, fluorescence uh, imaging. So we incubated these with the cells and then did microscopy. We could then take these cells, digest them um, with trypsin, and then do flow cytometry and show the difference between tumor cells and normal cells. And then again, because we really want to do this in patients, we went and we looked at human-derived cancer cells that are all pancreatic cancer. And you can see that the one clone versus a, a nonspecific clone bound better to the human cancer cells and to the mouse cancer cells than to the normal. Um, cells or the unrelated clones. So this was specific and it cross-reacts with both human and mouse. So we can do all the preclinical experiments that the FDA requires and then also use it uh, in human. So from there we make uh, the phage into imaging agents. So again this is part of our engineering biology. We can do all sorts of chemistry. So in this case we put fluorophores on these inject them into the animals, and then do intravital microscopy. So we make a laparoscopic incision, a small incision, into the, uh, into the animal. We put our, mic our microscope objective down onto the pancreas, and then we can image. So here's the wild-type animal. This is the KRAS-only animal, and this is the KRAS plus the tumor. In this case, it's just a P53 deletion uh, mouse model and not the full P16, P19. 
um, delete. It's not the P19, uh, P16 deletion. And again, that's part of the validation to test out multiple mouse models. I don't want it to be specific for one mouse model. It should be a universal phenomenon. And then after we're done imaging these animals, we can go ahead and uh, euthanize them and then do the histology. So here's the H&E, and then this is the anti-M13, so it's binding to the tumor um, in both cases, um, but not binding in the normal. Uh, we can also do other types of imaging, SPECT or PET imaging. So instead of putting a fluorophore or in addition to putting a fluorophore, we can put a macrocyclic chelator that will allow us, in this case, to chelate indium-111 for SPECT, or you can chelate zirconium for PET. Um, but what this allows us to do, so the phage are taking up non-specifically because they're big particles in the liver and the spleen, and then the arrow is pointing to the uh, to the tumor in the pancreas. So again, we're confirming before we make anything else, we are confirming that that peptide is able to drive binding to the tumor. Uh, so from there, we can conjugate them to almost anything. These are magnetic fluorescent nanoparticles. Um, they are MR active. Again, they're iron oxide cores. So the A part of this is an iron oxide core. It's a, there's a dextran um, coat around the iron oxide core. They're both magnetic and fluorescent. And we can inject these, again, do in vivo optical imaging. And what you're seeing is here are the, here's the tumor um, in red, but also we can look at the blood vessels. So by injecting a, a large molecular weight dextran with a different fluorophore, we can look at in this mouse model, so again, this is the transgenic, the extent of the vessels with the tumor. And in this case, there's, there's um, pretty good vascularization, which, which doesn't really reflect uh, what happens in the uh, human. But then over here is a zoomed out image. Um, again, this is the in, in, intravital in vivo imaging. You can see all of the tumor. So that's one of the caveats of this mouse model is there's multiple foci of the tumor. But what's also exciting is this individual looking at and imaging individual cells of the, the tumor streaming through the pancreas stroma. So it's really nice to start studying kinetics and such using these techniques. So from there, we started making the clinically relevant agent. In this incarnation, as a SPECT agent, we have a PET agent coming soon. And this is to make it completely chemically synthesized. So it's a tetrameric structure. So there's four of those peptides identified with a macrocyclic chelator that will chelate indium or zirconium or, or whatever we want. In this case, it's indium-111. We get this synthesized uh, GMP by a just peptide company, um, and then they send it to us. And then what we do is we inject it, and we can do spec CT imaging. And what I'm going to show you is a movie. In the upper right is the tumor, and then you can see the kidneys, which this is being eliminated by. But it gives us a 3D rendering of, of this animal. So if you go ahead and play the movie, Oh, is the movie not playing? Excellent. So um, what you were seeing was the, and I think that was the wrong movie actually, that's gonna come up later. But anyway, I'm just gonna go ahead and show you what this looks like in the still images. Um, but what you'll see is what I was pointing out. Here's the pancreas, and this mouse can spin. Here's the, actually, here's the tumor right here in all these images. These are the kidneys, this other red part that I'm pointing to. And then finally, these are peritoneal metastases that we're picking up, this little dot right here. So after we image, we sacrifice or euthanize the animal, we can do biodistribution, which tells us the injected dose per gram or gives us the concentration in each of the organs. And then, of course, we can do histology to confirm the, that there was a tumor there, and then also that these little spots that were taking up the agent were um, actual tumors and metastases. So that was great.
Um, and then from there, we do a whole bunch of mouse models. And so this is a human-derived xenograph, the L3.6 uh, PLs. That's orthotopic, so they're a cell line planted in the pancreas of the tumor. Um, that's immunocompromised. the tumor um, in the mouse, in the METS and the primary tumor. We also did a liver model, so this is splenic injection uh, of the tumor cells and then they, they migrate up to the liver and we were able with two cell lines, so the AK134s, which are the, the cell lines from the transgenic animal and pink ones, which are the human derived um, line. So both in an immunocompetent and immunocompromised, we're able to see the liver metastases. So this agent right now has been cleared by the FDA. We have actually injected one patient with no adverse effects. Um, and so we're still in the process of processing and understanding the data. But this agent is actually in clinical trials. So we're really excited um, and can't wait to see the outcome of the clinical trial. But like I said, these peptides aren't just imaging agents. We can also use them to conjugate them to other particles um, for, for um, drug delivery. And in this case, we've done this with liposome. So this is a targeted li liposome, um, the blue, and this is a dose escalation study versus a controlled liposome versus the blood pool for both. And what you can see is that even after 168 hours, we still have a twofold increase or a twofold higher accumulation in the tumors with targeted um, liposome versus non-targeted. Um, and in this case, the drug that we're delivering is a fluorescent small molecule. So we're not looking for a tumor decrease. We're just looking at how much is being taken up. Um, and those studies are ongoing, but we're really able to increase um, the amount of drug delivered to these tumors by using these liposome-based approaches. And then finally, I just got this uh, NIH funded, but using uh, AAV for G AAV adeno-associated virus for gene therapy. So in this case, what we did is we have a wild-type AAV, and this is serotype eight. Um, versus a uh, PTP, which is the peptide, pancreatic targeted peptide that we have. And we fuse that to the capsid protein of the AAV8. So again, doing a uh, viral display um, like we did with phage display, but this time it's in the AAV8 protein. Um, and then also, so that's transductional targeting, but for transcriptional targeting, we've also incorporated a pancreatic cancer sp specific promoter, ATDC. And so we have two levels of control. So in the upper left, that's the wild type virus and it's just expressing luciferase under the CMV reporter. And what you see is liver and, and some spleen involvement. And in the upper left, there's no tumor. So these animals are P53, um, but they're not activated. So these animals do not have, um, these animals are not crossed. They're not um, crossed with the Cree recombinase. So they are, they are, uh, they do not have a tumor. And so you see that, but when you have, when you inject the targeted um, transductional and transcriptional targeted, the animals are not expressing luciferase anywhere. However, when you have the, um, with the tumor, um, but no targeting, you still get the liver uh, uptake and you get a little bit in the pancreas, but you still get the other tumor or other tissues being targeted. But in the targeted, um, the transcriptional and transductional, you're only seeing it in the tumor. So again, this is a way now replacing the CMV with a drug of choice or a gene that would kill um, of choice, we would be able to hopefully do some therapy here. So we're pretty excited about that. Or as we're studying things, you could start to imagine we have peptides, and I'll show you later, for different compartments in the tumor microenvironment. So this would allow you to knock in or knock out any gene um, and therefore any protein 
in that tumor and study its effects and not doing a transgenics um, per se. And so that's all well and good. We have these peptides, but what does it bind to? And so this allows us to be able to identify the targets. It's not so easy to just go ahead and deconvolute what those peptides are binding to because it's only a seven amino acid peptide. And then you go ahead, you do the seven amino acid peptide, you do a blast search, for example, and a lot of things pop up. It's, it's not, um, it's just the way that it is. And so we've developed this method, uh, phage display based functional proteomics, that allows us to identify the binding partners. And so in the first step, what we do is we label the phage with biotin and also a photoactivatable crosslinker. So again, this comes out of our ways of using the phage as novel or phage as materials. You incubate it with the, with the cells and you do this at four degrees to minimize internalization let the phage bind, wash away phage that, that don't bind, use a UV lamp to activate the crosslinker, lice, and then incubate that with a biotinyl or a streptavidin coated uh, dynel bead, so magnetic bead. Allow those to incubate and bind, uh, wash the beads, break the crosslink, so elude it with uh, DTT, so reducing conditions, and then run the eluate on a gel um, to stain it with uh, mass spec compatible silver stain, cut out the unique band. So we also do control phage um, and control cell lines. So we're looking at for the unique bands because it's kind of messy and we're working on cleaning that up. But you cut out the unique bands and then um, send those off for in gel terrific digest and mass spec sequencing. And what comes back is a report that identifies what it's binding to. And then of course we validate so we take the eluate that we didn't run out on the gel, then do a Western blot using the antibody of the protein that the mass spec identified, and then also either make recombinant purified protein or just go and purchase it if it's commercially available and do an ELISA on purified protein. And so that way we are able to validate. So from this screen, we were able to identify the binding partners of the things with decent affinity and specificity. And what I want to draw your attention to is some of these that were already known, for example, in Exon A2. And in fact, that correlates uh, loosely with gemcitabine resistance. Um, so an Exon A2 is a marker of gemcitabine resistance. But the other thing I want you to focus on is this protein, plectin. So clone 27, the peptide that binds to pancreatic cancer that we're doing clinical trials, its binding partner is this protein, plectin. So what is plectin? Well, it's kind of an interesting little guy, and it's not so little. It's a 500 kilodalton intracellular protein that links the cytoskeleton, um, and it has a genetic disease. And so if there's a mutation in plectin, it leads to epidermal lysis bullosa, which is a skin blistering disease. And that's because one of its functions is to link the hemidesmosomes and to anchor the skin cells to other skin cells through beta-4. Um, the integrant beta-4, um, alpha-6 beta-4. So what I told you before is that this protein has to be accessible and it has to be on the cell surface. The phage cannot cross the plasma membrane unless it's through an active process. And so what we found through extensive experimentation is that in normal cells like skin and the genital urinary tract, plectin is cyto cytoplasmic. That's its normal place it's, and it does normal functions. However, in pancreatic cancer, it is expressed uh, and displayed on the cell surface. And so we've done extensive um, tissue microarray validation. It's not present in normal pancreas or chronic pancreatitis, PANIN 1 or 2. 60% of, of uh, PANIN 3 lesions are positive for plectin. Uh, 41 out of 41 of the pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma patients were positive. Um, in the liver, lymph node, and peritoneum, they are negative for plectin except for when a pancreatic cancer has metastasized. So the metastases are positive, but those tissues are negative. Um, we've also look at, looked at cysts, so I said that that was a high-risk patient population. And so 94% of the time, um, it's a 94 positive predictive value that if you have plectin 1, um, you have a, a high-grade dysplasia or a cancer in those, in those specimens. 
Plectin is also found in other cancers, notably bile duct uh, cholangiocarcinoma, that makes sense. The bile duct and the pancreas duct are very close to each other. Um, it's in ovarian cancer, non-small cell lung carcinoma, colon cancer, but notably absent in prostate cancer. So we actually use prostate cancer as a negative control for a lot of our studies. Um, and it has important roles, so I won't get into the gory details. This is all published in a PNAS paper from 2013. But um, plectin has 11 isoforms, eight, eight of which are coding. And so my grad student did a lot of work making lentiviral constructs for all of these. And what she found is that the isoforms 1A and 1F, the two isoforms that bind to the integrin beta 4, are the ones that have function in the, in the tumor. So when we knock down those proteins, we get a decrease in proliferation, invasion, and, uh, invasion and migration. Um, and then she can go ahead and rescue them by expressing those proteins. Um, again, this is showing invasion and migration. And on another level, that loss of the plectin actually decreases tumor growth and tumor aggressiveness. And so in both the L3.6PL and the, um, in the cell lines, the mouse cell lines um, from those transgenics, when we make stable knockdowns of those cells, which is actually really difficult. So if we leave them in culture too long, they will start to re-express, if you will, the, the cell culture, the whole cell culture will start to re-express plectin. So we have to knock it down and then use them right away. Um, but if we put these into the pancreas of these animals and then look at them at various time points, um, we can reduce the morbidity um, due to the pancreatic cancer or mortality due to the pancreatic cancer. And also we get less metastases. Um, from this in both the immunocompromised and the immunocompetent. And these, both of these are very aggressive cell models. And so usually we have to euthanize these animals uh, 10 days after implantation, which is why, um, or these animals all die uh, so many days after implantation, um, they really quickly. So these animals are, are, they actually die. It's not just that we are euthanizing them. Um, and that's not happening with this. So it seems to be an, uh, an important protein. Um, and other people have since published some things on different cancers. So uh, plectin has been shown to have a, it's a prognostic marker for head and neck squamous cell carcinoma. It's in esophageal cancer and also in colon cancer. And so uh, it's, these studies all confirmed our original findings. So then we started thinking, well, how is plectin on the cell surface? Um, and we started thinking about this in terms of exosomes. So there was this paper published uh, in 2008 by Rister Selly uh, et al. And it looked at the uh, protein components of an exosome. And so what we found that was really interesting is the blue arrows are pointing to the phage clones. So these are proteins that we identified through our phage clones, the annexin A2, histone 2A, um, and enolase 1. I don't have an arrow to it, but enolase. Um, and uh, what was interesting is that filament and spectrin are both proteins that plectin binds to. So they're binding partners of plectin. And we looked at the methods and what happened is, is because plectin is such an enormous protein, if you don't use a 5% gel and uh, allow it to run for a long time, it doesn't run in the gel. So we suspect that they missed plectin just because they, they were using a large um, gradient gel. Um, so it, it really just didn't get into their analysis. And so here's the exosomes, uh, the membranes bud in, um, they then form an early endosome. They then go into the multivesicular endosomes. The RAB27B and uh, RAB27A are helpful in this. And then this multivesicular body, the MVE, goes and fuses with the plasma membrane, and then it releases the exosomes. So exosomes have been shown to be really important for cell-cell communication. They have, their, they have function in normal cells. Dendritic cells make a lot of these. Melanosomes, that's how melanin is spread from cell to cell. So there's a lot of normal exosomes or normal um, of these small bodies. 
Um, but in cancer, they've been shown to uh, enhance cell-cell communication between the tumor and its microenvironment and contribute to aggressiveness. And so what we did is we just isolated exosomes from three cell lines and also from tumors that were growing in the, the orthotopic um, pancreas in the animal. And we were able to isolate exosomes from both of them. And they both were positive for uh, plectin. And these exosomes had very similar characteristics to what Rister Sally um, and colleagues had seen. And so when we knocked down plectin, what we discovered though, and we were doing EM just to see what would happen, is that actually plectin, uh, without plect or with plectin, the membranes are very, they're invaginated, there's lots of invadipodia, but without plectin, the membranes become more uh, quiescent, kind of like the human pancreatic ductal epithelium, so more normal pancreas cells. And so we actually quantitated this and the concentration of exosomes in the media of, of, um, of cells conditioned media were significantly lower when we knocked out plectin. And it was on par to knocking out RAB 27A and B, both proteins that have been previously shown to be important for exosome formation. So that was exciting. And then when we go ahead and we add these exosomes to cells, we can get an increase in invasion and migration of just um, the different uh, C6, which is a cancer line, a uh, glioma cancer line, but also the NIH3T3s, which are a transformed rat fibroblast line. But still, it was exciting that these plectin positive exosomes could, um, could uh, change the function. Um, and then there's a lot of other data that I'm just going to skip through, but suffice it to say, if you look at the PNAS paper, that um, a lot of a significant portion of the cell surface plectin is due to exosomes coming back and binding, plectin positive exosomes coming back and binding uh, to the cell surface. So when we incubate cells that are normally plectin minus on the cell surface with plectin positive exosomes, you get uh, the ability of the plectin antibody or plectin peptide to now bind to those cells where it didn't bind before. Um, and also um, um, in, and also you get these increases in invasion and migration. Not so much when you have the plectin negative exosomes. So when you normalize for number of exosomes, so you just use a lot more uh, media to gather the plectin minus exosomes. Uh, you don't get plectin on the cell surface. Um, and then we did some in vivo experiments where we injected, so tumors that were um, either just uh, the gray line, which are just the L3.6 is with a control um, SH, um, or uh, with the RAB27 knockdowns, which decreases exosomes. But we've shown that when you knock out RAB27 A or B, you do not decrease plectin expression. You just decrease the amount on the cell surface and you decrease the number of exosomes. Um, and so with those knockdowns, you get a decrease in the tumor growth. And so that's what that had been shown before too, is that exosomes are important for tumor growth. But then when we injected either plectin negative exosomes, the same number of plectin negative or plectin positive exosomes, you didn't rescue the ability of the tumors to grow. However, when you injected the plectin positive exosomes, we actually got um, more growth, more aggressive growth. So there's something about plectin um, and whatever it's binding to that is dictating uh, the aggressiveness in, in these exosomes. So we did proteomics analysis and there are significant differences between the proteome of a plectin positive exosome and a plectin minus uh, exosome. So in the last few minutes that I have, um, what of the tumor microenvironment? So we can do screens on a whole bunch of things. SPARC is important. It's secreted protein, acidic and rich in cysteine. It dictates the um, fiber, nectin, and collagen uh, layering in the tumor. It's also associated with a lot of aggressive tumors, not just pancreatic cancer. We've been able to identify new spark ligands that bind to spark. We can make uh, nanoparticles that allow us again to deliver things to the spark. Um, so here's the, the uh, animals on the left are, have the tumors that are spark positive. 
these are the targeted nanoparticles and the animals on the, the right are the, the non-targeted. These are the same animals. So we can actually, with this optical imaging, we can tell the difference between the two fluorophores. So the spark positive nanoparticles are in one wavelength, the spark negative animals are in a, the spark non, the non-targeted nanoparticles are in another wavelength. And so using um, the same animal, we can inject the same, uh, we can inject the, the two nanoparticles and then compare and contrast. Um, and then three hours post injection. Uh, so that was the primary, that was the sub Q tumor. We also did a bone metastasis. And so the animal on, on the left side, um, there is a bone metastasis and the spark agent is picking it up right here. But the animal on the right um, has, uh, does not have a tumor in its leg. And so, um, and then here's the H&E for the spark expression. So again, we're able to image the spark positive tumors. Um, and then we can also image uh, metastasis in the lung. So if you go ahead and just uh, play the video here, you can just see the um, metastases from this animal model in the lung. So again, this is superimposed with a CT so we can get anatomic uh, imaging. So the, the uh, colored um, green and, and reddish halo things are the agent and the, the rest is a CT. Um, so from there, we're also looking at different expressions of molecules. So uh, one of my colleagues, Jill Slack Davis, has been working on ovarian cancer. And what she's found is that VCAM is expressed in the um, peritoneum before ovarian cancer metastasizes to the peritoneum um, and they're VCAM positive. And also VCAM is a marker of tamoxifen resistance. And so we were able to use a VCAM targeted fluorescent agent and also a SPECT agent to image uh, in vivo non-invasively um, VCAM expression in the tumor microenvironment. And we're using this model to study the microenvironment and its role in ovarian metastases. We were also able to monitor the therapeutic response uh, with this VCAM targeted agent. So there were cell lines that were resistant to cisplatinin versus cell lines that were sensitive to cisplatinin. And what we were able to see is that um, the VCAM expression increases when they are cisplatin resistant, um, but it stays roughly about the same when they're, v when they're cisplatin sensitive. Um, and finally, the very last slide before I'll take your questions is we are also looking at the immune system and the interaction of the immune cells with um, the endothelium in the tumor. And we're looking to re-engineer those vessels. So what we were able to do is label uh, T cells, um, inject them into an animal that had a melanoma on its ear, and then track them um, using video. So again, non-invasive, and the ear is very thin, and so we were able to do this. Uh, but what you're seeing here is here's the normal vessels of the ear skin. Here's the tumor associated vessels. You can see the tortuosity um, on the right hand side of that image. Um, and then we, before we inject via tail vein, the primed uh, T cells, we get our, our video ready. And so you don't move the microscope. And what we can see is right after injection, we're already getting T cells into this. And then what we can do is we can follow this along um, in the video. So in this red arrow that you see starting here, that T cell started right here. That's when it came into our frame and we could track it up along here and we can uh, get metrics for this. So average distance and then in the D panel, what you're seeing is um, all those red arrows are pointing to T cells and we can get the average distance to nearest in plane vessels so we can see how far they transmigrated in the eye panel, you can start to see um, rolling versus adherence, so we can look at the interactions. And as we do different therapies, how does it change? And then here in the A and B panel, that's again the fluorescence optical imaging of the ear. This is in vivo non-invasive. 
And what you're seeing is that all of these arrows are pointing to the red hot spots or the lymph nodes. So the, the T cells are getting in the, the lymph nodes. Um, and then you can see a, a few of them in the arrow pointing with the T, that's the tumor. So we're really excited about uh, working on this. And this is a collaboration with Vic Engelhart here at UVA. So with that being said, there's a picture of the lab and uh, in the last 10 minutes, I'm happy to take any questions that you guys might have. So please, uh, please submit them and I will, I will answer questions. All right, so no one has any questions? Uh, so um, we got a question, have you used the targeted nanoparticle for therapy? Um, we are starting to. Um, we actually have in a, different, in, uh, in a different incarnation, so we've been loading small molecule drugs and testing their efficacy. So yes, yes, we have used it for, for therapy. And we've been working on, um, these are liposome-based nanoparticles, and so we've been working on each drug has its own loading conditions and, and such. And so uh, you have to do a little bit of work on loading them um, and looking at release kinetics, potentially changing lipid formulation depending on when you want it to release. But, but yes, we have used the nanoparticles for therapy. Well, I guess uh, if there's no other questions, um, I think everybody should by now have uh, been able to type in and, and figured out how to do it. But uh, if there's no other questions, then uh, I'll, I'll thank you guys all now for listening and then sign off. Um, and then if you have any questions, you can go ahead and email me and I'm happy to email, collaborate, have a discussion. Um, this is the fun part of science. So uh, again, thank everybody again, and uh, I look forward to your emails.